Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Isn't it good to be able to gather to worship our Lord? Amen? Amen. Praise his name. All right, I'm going to start with a verse of scripture this morning from Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. If you would bow with me in prayer. Father, we indeed have so much to thank you for today, for your grace, your mercy. Father, we thank you for your greatness and your power. We thank you, Lord, for all you are doing in our lives, the lives of our families, in our nation, in this world. And Father, as you know, the world is troubled today because of what's happening far away from here. But nonetheless, Lord, our hearts go out to the people of the Ukraine and their suffering and their fear and their torment that they're going through today. We lift them up and ask you to touch the hearts of the leaders who are involved in all of this on every side. We know that your word declares, Father, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whithersoever he will. We pray, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of some leaders today. Bring about your will, Father. We acknowledge your sovereignty, Lord. We acknowledge that you know best, and we acknowledge that you're in charge, and you just tell us to rest in your love and your mercy and your providence. We want to rest today, Father. We want to turn our hearts toward you, our audience of one, as we worship you, Lord. Help us to lay aside our fears and frets and worries and cares and just focus on you for a while that our hearts may be lifted. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> we all have a lot of reasons to thank the Lord. Amen. This first song is called 10,000 Reasons. I think if we were to think about it, we probably have at least that many reasons to thank Him. Amen. 10,000 reasons. Everyone stand, please. sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Oh, my soul, I'll 
his name. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, we have so much to praise you for today, not the least of which is Pastor Calvin. He's coming to preach, Father. He needs your touch. He needs your grace. He needs the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, that you would touch his mind and his heart. Help his words to be empowered by the Holy Spirit as he preaches to us today the message you have given him. We pray that you would help us, Lord, to be attentive and to have open hearts as you teach us, instruct us, and guide us from your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and just thankful to be here in the house of the Lord. As you heard, Pastor Kevin's not here today, so you have me instead. Y'all pray for Pastor Kevin and his wife. They're away on a, just a weekend together. Um, they're just enjoying some time to themselves, um, which is um, it's good for all couples to be able to do and to be able to get away and spend that time together. Uh, but for us this morning, we're going to continue on with our sermon series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, this week we finish up the uh, fifth chapter of Matthew. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 38, and we'll be going on through the rest of the chapter. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 38. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Verse number 38, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. 
And if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And then he goes on and he uh, expands on another uh, one of the Old Testament laws. Where he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, and then he adds this on, and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. <clears throat> for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? What, what, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, uh, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? And then he finishes up in verse number 30, 48, and he says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you can be seated. As I was in my prayer time and studying these verses and studying this, this, this section of Scripture, these two pericopes here, as I was uh, studying them, um, God led me into a, a different direction than what I would normally do in, in, in preaching. Normally I like to pick apart verses, it's called ex expository preaching, but uh, God led me into a different direction with this because um, I think in order to really grasp and understand what Jesus is saying here, uh, it's important for us to, to, to know his audience, uh, the Jewish audience that was listening to him during this time, and what would have been going through their minds as Jesus is teaching that. But in order to fully grasp that, let's go back in history. And so we're going to go back in time to about the time of Moses. We'll start with Moses. Uh, because as Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, most of you are familiar with that account in the Bible, in the book of Exodus. Moses leads them out of Egypt, and he's leading them towards the promised land. And so it's a journey that takes them two years. During that two years, Moses receives the law from God. Uh, this is the very same law that Jesus is quoting here over and over again in Matthew chapter 5. And so Moses is receiving this law. He's giving it to the people so that they can be a different people. They can be a holy nation. God wants Israel to be set apart from all the nations around them. He wants them to be different. And so he gives them his word. He gives them his law so that they can... Be different, So they could be a shining light, that city on a hill, to lead other nations to him. They were to be different. But as you know, they get up to the promised land, they get to a place called Kadesh Barnea, and they refuse to go in. They got scared, they, these people are too big, they're too you know, massive, they're too scary, we're not going in. We're, matter of fact, Moses, we're going back to Egypt. And so God judges them. And because of that, they spend the next 38 years out in the wilderness. After 40 years in total being out in the wilderness, they're finally allowed to go in. They go in, Moses has passed away, Joshua leads them in, and they take possession of that land that God has promised them. Once they get in, for the most part, they're following God during Joshua's lifetime. But as soon as Joshua dies... Uh, we see this same story repeated over and over and over again throughout the book of Judges, uh, which is what happens next after Joshua passes away. Joshua passes away, and the sons of Israel does evil in the sight of the Lord. They forsake God. They go after all of these foreign gods, all of these pagan religions, and they even uh, practice uh, their, their, their awful worship services that they and the way that they would worship these pagan gods, and they would follow these practices, and so God would end up judging them and by allowing another nation to come in and conquer them. After being under a nation for a while, they would repent. God would bring up a judge. This judge would lead them to victory over that nation, and they would follow God until that judge died. And when that judge died, same process all over again, where they fell away from God. God allowed them to be conquered by another nation until they repented. And this goes throughout the whole book of Judges. And then when we get to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, uh, the people are like, you know what, we're tired of Judges, we're tired of this, we want a king like everybody else. And so God allows them to have this first, the first king who was Saul. 
Saul wasn't a very good king, but he ended up dying, and the kingdom went to King David. Now, David, David was different. When you look at David and you see his life, he is different than a lot of the other Israelites. As a matter of fact, the description of David is David is a man after God's own heart. You see, when David looked at God's word, most of the Israelites, when they looked at Moses' words way back here in the Old Testament, when they uh, looked at Moses' law, what did they see? They saw a series of do's and don'ts. They just saw, you, you were to do this, do this, do this, but don't do this, this, and this. David saw it for what God had intended it to be. Gave, David saw it, and when he saw it, he realized how wicked he was. He looked at God's word in light of his own heart and realized he needed God and he needed to lean on God. And he writes, writes these beautiful psalms for us where he's expressing his dependence on God, where he's confessing his sins to God. And, and David wasn't a perfect person, but that was a man that loved God. And he was he that the law's purpose was to lead us to God. And that the law's purpose was to change our hearts. Not necessarily change our outward appearance, because once we change our hearts, the outward, what comes outside is going to follow through. Well, David ends up passing away, and the kingdom goes to his son Solomon. Solomon starts off really good. He asks for a heart of wisdom so that he can be a good king king over the Israelites, um, and then he, he as we say in the south, he got too big for his own britches and decided to uh, just marry all these foreign women. He figured, hey, if I marry this king's daughter, this, this king isn't going to want to attack us because his family's here. If I marry this king's daughter, he's not going to want to. And so he makes peace through marrying all these foreign women. But what did they end up doing to him? As they lead his heart astray, and his heart starts seeking after all of these false gods. And so starts Israel down that spiral again. God tells Solomon, because of his evilness, because of his wickedness, because of what he had done, he's going to tear the kingdom from him. He's not going to do it in his lifetime, but in his son's lifetime for the sake of King David. So his son, Rehoboam, takes charge. When he becomes king, the kingdom is split. Two, two kingdoms now. You've got the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Southern kingdom of Judah... They continue on with the Davidic line of kings, kings that come from King David. Northern Kingdom, they had their own set of kings. Northern Kingdom, every single king was evil. They, they, they didn't have one good king in the Northern Kingdom. And so because their hearts were led astray so often, and they just continued down this, this terrible path that they were on, uh, in the 700s, I think around 740 B.C., they were captured and uh, conquered by the Assyrian Empire. Southern Kingdom, they fared a little bit better. They get to 586 B.C. before they are conquered. They had a few good kings in the Southern Kingdom. But for the most part, they had a lot of evil kings. And there, you see this pattern with Israel over and over again, that their hearts are led astray. That instead of following God's Word, what are they doing? They're following anything and everything but God and His Word. And so God allows them to be captured. They're taken away by the Babylonians, and Israel is no more. They stay in captivity for uh, 70 years. They stay in captivity for uh, uh, 70 years uh, during that time. And they failed before that to be that light, shining light, that city on a hill that God wanted them to be. So after 70 years, now they're under the rule of the Medes and the Persians. The Babylonians have been conquered. They're under the rule of the Medes and the Persians. Persian king says, all right, you can go back to your homeland. They go back and they start rebuilding. And I promise you we're going to get back to Matthew. I promise you. Just hang with me. <laughs> this, this all has to do with what Jesus is talking about. So you've got to hang with me here. So they get back into their homeland. And what is one of the things that they do? They do a couple of things because they realize by falling away from God, by not following His Word, and by forsaking God's Word, God judged them. And they said, you know what? We're not doing that again. We're not going to follow we're not going to go down that path anymore. And so they built synagogues everywhere. That way people, the people would have access to go to the synagogue to hear God's word being read. They set up uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and these would be the religious leaders that would make sure that they are following God's word and not following after these pagan religions. They said, we're not doing that again. 
And just to make sure the people were following God's word, what did the Pharisees do? They added on extra laws. For each, each one of God's laws, they added on a bunch of extra laws. So just, just one of them, for example, God says to honor the Sabbath day, to, to rest on the Sabbath day. Six days shall work, on the seventh shall be a Sabbath. You'd rest um, just as God rested on his seventh day after creation. What did the Pharisees do? They added on, I looked it up, 39 extra rules to make sure you were resting on the Sabbath day. And that could range from you can't walk any more than two-thirds of a mile to you can't even look in the mirror on the Sabbath day. You can't light a fire on the Sabbath day. And so these were all these extra um, rules that they placed on top of God's Word. And it became a burden to the people. And the people went from worshiping false gods and pagan religions to worshiping God's law instead of the lawgiver. They made the law their God. That's what was first in their life was the law, but not the God of the law. They still missed it. <clears throat> and so for them, it was about the external appearance. We look good. You know, look at, look at us. Look at my long prayers that I'm praying. You know, I'm a good Jew. I'm going to synagogue every Sabbath. I'm a good Jew. I tithe the dill and the mint. I tithe everything that I get, even down to just the I'm growing in my garden. I'm tithing. Look at me. I'm a good Jew. But inside, it was still evil. Inside, they were still selfish. And inside, they still had no heart for God. So that when Jesus comes on the scene, what does he say to the Pharisees? He says to the Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. Everything looks great, but inside you're still dead. You still missed it. You thought you were doing the right thing, but you're worshiping the law and not the lawgiver. And so in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus is quoting the law to them, this is something that's familiar to them, um, and he's showing them by expanding on it, He's showing them it's not about the external appearance, but about what's going on in your heart. So that when he says, so that when he says, don't commit murder, and the Jews are sitting there like, yep, I'm doing pretty good. I never killed anybody. What does Jesus say? Hey, if you hate someone in your heart, if you hold hatred for somebody in your heart, you've already committed murder. It's about what's going on in your heart. It's not about that external appearance, but what's going on inside And he says, don't commit adultery. And the Jews are like, yep, I'm doing pretty good. Never cheated on my wife. Never cheated on my husband. I'm doing pretty good. And Jesus says, what's going on in your heart? Where's your eyes been going? What have you been looking at? Because if you look at a woman, you look at a man with lust, that's committing adultery. And so Jesus brings it back to what it really comes down to, and that's in their heart. Because as Jesus would later on say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's going on in your heart is going to eventually come out. And if you have hatred in your heart, it could definitely come out in murder or in some type of anger, rage issue. If you have lust in your heart, that could come out into uh, physical adultery. And so Jesus is telling them, get your heart right and the external actions will follow. And so what Jesus is really getting to here is that we can't follow the law. There's no way we can follow this. It's it's too much for us. Yeah, we can look good on the outside, but what's going on inside? The inside tells the whole truth that we can't live up to this. And when we realize how sinful we are, just like David did in the Old Testament by examining our own hearts, it leads us to trust in God and not trust in ourselves. That's what the Jews were doing. They were trusting in themselves. Look at how good I can look on the outside. They were trusting in their own uh, self-sufficiency and what they could do. But Jesus says, no, the law is to help us understand that we can't do it on our own. We need God. We need to lean on Him. We need a Savior 
that can save us from our own sinful wickedness. So now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, so now when we get to verse number 38, Jesus quotes the Old Testament law. He says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And that is what was said in the Old Testament. The Jews were very familiar with this. So when he says that, uh, this was a law that Moses uh, gave them. It's in uh, Exodus, the later chapters of Exodus, around chapter 21. It's in Leviticus, uh, and it's in Deuteronomy. So it's repeated three times. But in the context, when you read it in the context of those three uh, books, it's always, a, it was always a law for the magistrate to follow. Whoever was handing down judgments, the government, the civil authorities to follow. This was not a law for you as an individual to follow. It was, for the, it was to give the government a guideline for punishing crimes. Because in many nations around the world, you steal a loaf of bread and you may get your hand chopped off. You steal a loaf of bread and you, they could take your life if you steal it from the right person. And so oftentimes punishment would far outweigh the crime and God says no my people are to be a different. And so you are to punish crime in accordance uh, with the crime that is being committed. You're not to just overdo it. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, life for life is what it says. And so this was a guideline for the governing bodies. But what did the Jews do? They used this as their way of, making, of getting personal revenge. This was their way of saying, you know what? You wronged me. I'm going to get you back after, after all. Word says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I'm going to get you. You just watch, you better watch your back. Because that's what they were going to do. But God says, no, 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 no. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You, let the, you leave room for the wrath of God. You worry about your response. You worry about your heart. You let the law deal with lawbreakers. You worry about your response. And so Jesus says uh, in the next verse, he clarifies it for them. In verse number 39, but I tell you, do not well, not to resist an evil person. Sorry, I, I study in um, New American Standard, so sometimes I'll quote from there. Um, he says, uh, not to resist an evil person. That word not to resist, that means to stand against or to stand in opposition to an evil person or when someone has wronged you. So when someone wrongs you, Jesus says, don't stand in opposition to them. If someone's getting angry with you or somebody wrongs you, don't get angry with them and respond the same way. Respond in anger and just hatred and vile. Somebody cuts you off in traffic and you just start yelling and screaming and throwing your hands up and everything else at them. Don't stand in opposition to those evil people. Don't respond in the same way that they did to you. And so, um, he says, you know, let the court handle those cases of law. Because that's what this law was for, was for the courts to handle it. Let God handle the wrongs that are done. But for you, you respond in love. That's what I want from you. Don't resist. In other words, don't respond in anger. And so then Jesus follows up, just in case they're missing the point, just in case they're not sure what he's talking about here, what that means. He gives four examples of how to do that. The thing to remember with these four examples that, that follow, uh, starting in this verse that you see up on the screen, and then in verse number 40 and 41 and 42, he gives three more examples, is that Jesus is not adding on to that law. He's not giving them four more laws to follow. He wasn't doing what the Pharisees did by adding on. These are just w what I said. They're, they're examples. They're not something that has to be followed in every situation, every culture, every time period. These are just examples to show how you not resist an evil person. And so he says in verse number 39, I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But then he goes on and says, gives a first example. And he says, whoever slaps you on your right cheek. Oh, 39. There you go. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And so when he goes and he says that, uh, is Jesus... Literally saying there, somebody slaps you on their cheek that you look at them and say, come on, hit me here. Come on, let's do it again. Come on, big boy. Obviously not. He's not telling them to do that. He's saying to be prepared to be wronged again. We can look at Jesus' own example in John chapter 18. Jesus is on trial and they ask him about his teachings. And so Jesus says, you've heard my teachings. I haven't hid my teachings from anybody. 
I've been out in public speaking all these years. I've been in the synagogues uh, teaching like, and in the temples. I have not hidden anything from you. And it says, when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? And so Jesus is slapped. What does Jesus do? Does he say, hey, here you go, slap me again? What does he say? He says, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? So he, Jesus is appealing to the law here. He says, hey, what law have I broken that you're going to slap me? So he's availing himself to the law that's available to him, but he is still submitting to uh, the fact that they may hit him again. And he's responding in love. He's not saying, why did you hit me? I didn't do anything wrong. You know, he's not responding in anger. He's responding in love. But he's still, notice, he's availing himself to the laws available to him. Paul did the same thing. When we look at Paul uh, in the book of Acts, there were so many times Paul would get arrested. He was, uh, he'd be around preaching. People would get angry and the mob would ensue. And Romans, you know, they loved their peace. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, they loved their peace. And so anytime there was a mob, Paul would get arrested. Paul gets arrested. One of the first things they do, they start beating him. What did Paul do? Did he just sit there and let him beat him? Most of the time, he said, hey, should you be beating a Roman citizen? He doesn't respond in anger and say, hey, don't you know that I'm a Roman citizen? You better not be beating me. I'm going to go to see your manager. I'm going to go to the boss because of you. Hey, should you be beating a Roman citizen? And the guards would always say, you're a citizen? Yeah. I said, oh, okay. And they back off and they wouldn't beat him because they wasn't supposed to beat a Roman citizen without a trial. And so Paul was availing himself again to the laws that were available to him. But if they decided to break the law and continue beating him, he would still be prepared to take that beating. And as oftentimes he did take those beatings. Um, but the key thing is that he responded in love. He didn't tell them, hey, yep, that was good. Keep on beating me. Keep hitting well, I want you to keep doing it even more. No, he responds in love to them, avails himself to what laws that he has, uh, and he loves them. And then you see, and a lot of times, Paul was even able to win those jailers to Christ because of his response in love. And that's, that was Jesus' point, that we should be different, that we should be shining lights. We should be that city on a hill. As Jesus said earlier in this chapter, we are to be salt and light in this world. And so, as I read in one of the commentaries, it says, uh, it is the preparedness after one indignity not to invite another, but to submit meekly to another without retaliation. And this is the strong language uh, which this strong language is meant to convey. And so Jesus is telling us that we're not to invite more, but if it comes, to still respond in love and not to retaliate. And then he goes on in verse number 40, and he gives three more examples after this, and we're going to go quickly through there. Um, but he says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. So you appeal to the law on a situ situation, and the law treats you unfairly. Okay? You can still respond in love. Someone maybe goes to the law about you, and you feel that it's unfair. You can still respond to that person in love, not in hatred or bitterness, not looking to get revenge on that person because if that person did you wrong, let God handle that. Leave room for God's vengeance. You worry about how you respond. And then in verse number 41, he says, gives another example. This was a common practice by the uh, Roman soldiers. Whoever forces, whoever compels you, sorry, I got to read from this one. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. This was something that the soldiers would do. You would, uh, the soldiers would, uh, be on a march, and they could look at you and say, hey, you, carry my stuff. And you'd have to carry it with them for a thousand paces, which was just short of what our miles is. So that's why it says, uh, if he compels you to go one mile, go with them two. And you could imagine putting yourself in one of these Jews' place. They, maybe they just got off of work. They're on their way home. They're hungry. They're tired. They're ready to get home to see their families. And all of a sudden, this soldier snatches them away and says, hey, carry my stuff for another mile. And now you've got to carry it for a mile. And then once you're done carrying it for a mile, now you've got another mile to walk back. And you can imagine them just being grumbling and complaining and being angry about it. But Jesus says, no, you're to respond in love. Even when you're asked to do something or forced to do something you don't want to do, 
Respond in love. It even tells them to go the extra mile in that. Go another mile with them. Use that time to witness. Use that time to spread the gospel to them. <clears throat> now, he's not saying when you're forced to do something illegal or unethical or immoral. Um, obviously, in those cases, you shouldn't follow along. Um, but this is something that seems to be more of an inconvenience. Um, that you are supposed to respond in love. And then in verse number 42, to finish out this pericope here. Uh, Give to him who asks of you. And to him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You see, all these verses really are, are, are just examples of responding in love. And he sums it up here. Um, it says, even when you're wronged, even when you feel like you're wronged, respond in love. Don't turn away from them. Even if you see somebody who has uh, wronged you, love them anyway. You see they've got a need, you can still meet that need. You know, I think about, um, I, th I think about the, the church in Charleston that was, uh, that was shot up and uh, the way those church members showed up to court and their response to that young man in court and how they showed him love. They let the law handle the legal side. But their response to him was in love. And I imagine that was a hard thing to do. And you can't do, have that kind of love apart from God. And that's Jesus' point. We can't have that. We can't do this on our own. And this just forces us to go and to seek God, to have him help us with this. And then one other side note, these are um, showing, notice these are showing kind of small things as uh, most of the commentaries I read. Um, these are showing small things. You know, if it's something major, such as that, that, that church shooting, you can still respond in love, such as those people do, but you let the law handle legal things. You let the law handle that. Um, you know, if your life's in danger, obviously you can save yourself, protect yourself. Jesus, uh, there's a time where Jesus was teaching um, in a synagogue on the Sabbath, and the mob grabbed him. They got angry. They grabbed him, and they're about to throw him off a cliff. Jesus did there and let him throw him off a cliff, what did he do? It says he slipped through the crowd unnoticed and went away. He saved himself from that. Paul, there were times where his life was in danger, and one time they had to lower him down through a basket off a city wall to get him out of danger. And so um, it doesn't negate the law of self-preservation. It also doesn't um, mean that if, you're, uh, you know, if you see someone in danger that you can't help them. It says turn the other cheek, not turn the blind eye. So you can help others. Jesus often did that as well. The woman that was brought before him where they were about to stone her, what does she do? She, he knew that they were, she, they were using her as a pawn to try to get him. And they were, they, which Stoning her would have just been a, you know, icing on the cake for them. They'd have loved to stone somebody. But Jesus says to him, he protects her. He says, those of you without sin cast the first stone. When he sees the money changers in the temple taking advantage of all the poor people by trying to sell them sacrifices uh, for the Passover, he realizes they're taking advantage of all these people, and Jesus gets angry about that because he sees the wrong being done. Um, and so keep that in mind with that. And so the next one, he says, to love your enemies. You heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Now, that first part there, You've heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor. That is in the Old Testament. That was one of the laws. But that second part where it says, and hate your enemies, was not part of the law. That was something that they added on to it. Jesus was saying this just in case they were misunderstanding what he was just said. He just said, you respond in love. And in case they're thinking it's about the outward appearance, I'm going to respond in love, but I'm going to hate that person. You know what? I'm going to hold a grudge against them the rest of my life. I'm never going to, I'm going to talk bad about that person, but as far as I respond to them, I'll respond in love. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Just in case you're missing the point here, in verse number 44, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Even when those people wrong you, you respond in love, you can still love your enemies. And bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And so, Jesus shows them that loving your neighbor also includes loving your enemies. Um, and not just to love them, but to pray for them. Man, that's hard sometimes. Somebody really uh, does you wrong and you're supposed to pray for them. Man, that's hard. Hard to love some people sometimes. And that's the point. It is hard. Sometimes it may be even be impossible. That's Jesus' point here. Um, 
And Jesus goes on to say, he says, if you only love those who love you, you're, you're no different than the Gentiles. You're no different than the tax collectors. But God calls this, uh, uh, makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the just and the unjust. Um, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Everybody does that. Even tax collectors do that. And they're some of the most crooked people of that day. And then verse 47, he says, if you greet your brother and only... What, what do you do more than the others? You know, even tax collectors do that. And he says, you're not doing anything different than everybody else just because you do those things. He says, no, you're to be set apart. Love those who hate you. Love those who you would consider your enemies. It's going to be hard, obviously. And then he gives, and he sums it up with something that's really hard. He says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect in case you're still not getting it and realizing, I can't do that. This was Jesus' point. That we are to be different. We are to be a shining light. We are to be the city on a hill. But we can't do it apart from God. And so when you look at this and it seems impossible, good. It's supposed to seem impossible. It's supposed to look impossible because we can't. There's no way we can live up to that. If we could live up to that, Jesus wouldn't have come and died on the cross. And so we can't follow it perfect. Our hearts are wicked when we exam examine it in the light of God's law, as Jesus is doing. He's asking us to examine our hearts in the light of God's law. We realize that we can't live up to it and that we need a Savior. And so it should cause us to lean on Him in those times when we're tempted to fall away, when we do the wrong thing, when we respond in anger, when we hate someone who has wronged us. It should drive us to the throne of God. When somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're angry about it and start yelling at them, Jesus says, no, 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 don't respond in anger, but to pray for them. You know, maybe, maybe they were having a bad day. Maybe they were in a hurry. You don't know what's going on. Maybe they just don't know how to drive. I don't know. Um, but he says, don't yell at them. Don't, don't throw up hand motions or whatever else or get beside them and start you know, roll down your window to start an argument with them or anything else. Respond in love. But if you do respond in anger, what are we to do? Go to the Father. Pray. Ask God to forgive us. Work on our hearts because as we work on our hearts, eventually we'll come to understand, hey, I probably don't need to yell at this person. Maybe, maybe God had them swerve in front of me and slow me down because God knew there was something much worse down the road that I would have been involved in had I continued on at that speed. I don't know. You know, you go out to eat and your waitress gets your food wrong and you perceive that as a wrong done to you and don't respond in anger, respond in love. Maybe that waitress having a bad day. Maybe she got your order confused. Who knows? But if you do respond in anger, ask God to help you. Ask God to forgive you. And if you respond in anger to a waitress or something like that, ask them to forgive you. Leave them an extra tip. Leave them a, a bigger tip and tell them, you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have responded that way. Um, but let, if you fail or when you fail, let those failures lead you to God, not away from Him. Because as you lean on Him, those failures are going to become less and less because you're working on your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So as we lean on God when we fail, God's going to work on that. And He's going to help us and help us to grow let him do that, work on our hearts, and our actions will follow. With that, we'll go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for another day that you've given us. God, we thank you for uh, being with us today. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for this sermon that Jesus preached and the words that he spoke so many years ago that still speaks to our hearts today. And God, I pray that you help us to respond to those around us in love, not in anger, not in hatred, not in bitterness or revenge, God, but we respond in love. Help us to work on our hearts, God. Help us to lean on you when we fail. And we love you, Jesus, and these things we ask in your name. Amen.